Hi, Kin, how are you? Hello. So yeah, I'll let you MC the, this track, and uh, yeah, I think it's the best, uh, the best MC we can have uh, for with uh, one of the uh, best also first speaker for uh, for for this industry. Well, Thanks, buddy. I'm just gonna let you go for it, Shelby. Go ahead and kick things off. I, I don't think you need any introduction. You know your stuff, but uh, take it away, and then I'll handle from there. Great. Okay. So, um, can you see my slides? We can. Awesome. Okay. All right. Let me also make sure I can see my speaker notes. Um, all right. Okay. So, um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to kick off this track, um, especially following up on Oz's talk and great Q&A session that just ended. Um, I think I'm going to be building on a lot of those ideas that he already started talking about. Um, so it was a great, great segue. Um, so first, just a little bit about me. I work at the US Digital Service, um, which is an agency that sits within federal government. We uh, bring federal, we bring senior level technologists into the government to help modernize technology across different agencies. And we come in for certain, you know, small tours of duty anywhere from six months to four years. The average time period is around one year and 10 months. Um, and we go across the federal government. So I'm currently sitting under the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, um, which is part of the Department of Health and Human Services. But we also have folks at the VA, um, at Department of Homeland Security, um, and social uh, small business administration and social security um, among other agencies too. Um, so I also have a background in healthcare interoperability and APIs. I've been doing civic tech since I got started in technology um, eight or nine years ago and I've been doing APIs ever since. Before I joined the US Digital Service, I was working at a healthcare technology company addressing the social determinants of health. So all the things that go into your healthcare that are not directly medical um, and building out APIs and integrations um, to address those needs. And I also have a blog on civic tech um, called civicunrest.com, which is an API joke um, on rest. So um, I think that I am funny sometimes. Um, my Twitter handle is Switzerly, so feel free to um, DM me if you want to follow up with any of this conversation after my talk. So, why am I here today? Um, so, I'm here because I am pretty angry about the state of healthcare technology in the U.S. Um, we've been working towards interoperability, we've been working towards better technology for decades, um, and yet we still have not achieved interoperability, and we still are really lacking a user focus in our technology. And this is a huge problem, not only for patients themselves, and like they are really feeling the, the brunt of this, but also on the American public. And what I've been doing for the past few months specifically is I've been working um, on the ground in different states across the US, investigating um, public health data systems, and this is a picture of a pile of faxes um, that is faxing, you know, different local jurisdictions are faxing patient data across jurisdiction lines in order to share cases with other jurisdictions like other counties and other states um, about coronavirus cases that are um, happening and need to be investigated. And this is, this is the state of so much of healthcare technology. This is definitely the state of much of public health across the US, um, which unfortunately I think that we have typically seen public health to be siloed away from healthcare industry. And I think that those things need to merge. But honestly, a lot of healthcare companies and hospitals are using faxes um, as a really base level of data transfer. And this is really unacceptable in 2020 and it's depressing. Um, but in some ways, I also wanna say that I think that I've been really inspired over the past few months too um, at the level of creativity and hard work people have used to get around these old systems like this. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of in a point where I'm very frustrated, uh, but also inspired. And I think we have a really good opportunity to make change. So a uh, brief agenda, I'm gonna talk about interoperability and APIs in healthcare. I'm gonna go over a little bit of the history of the journey to interoperability in healthcare. And I'm gonna talk about some ideas for getting from interoperability to interoperable APIs. So what is interoperability in healthcare? I think we need to take a step back and ask that question. Um, and before that, let's zoom out even further 
and let's define interoperability. So this is from Merriam-Webster. Interoperability is a noun that means the ability of a system, such as a weapon system, to work with or use the parts or equipment of another system. Um, I don't know why, but whenever I looked up the definition of interoperability in any online dictionary, they referred to weapon systems as an example. Seems kind of violent, not sure why. Um, but at a high level, we're really just talking about systems being able to use the parts or functionality of other systems. And what does this mean if we zoom in a little bit further um, for just modern software? It's not even getting to healthcare yet. Well, in the modern software industry, we don't really have a conversation about interoperability. We talk about APIs. And I think that this is a really big distinction that I'm gonna dive into. Uh, because when we talk about APIs, we're talking about APIs that are products. Um, and I think this brings a, love, a mentality that we just don't see in healthcare. APIs, um, if they are products, they have a product life cycle. Uh, they may start with a level of engagement or beginning with design strategy. You build the API, you manage the API, things change. Uh, this cycle is probably familiar to a lot of people in the audience. You can see various versions of this kind of across the internet in different API presentations. There can be 10 to 20 steps or phases within the cycle, uh, but really they're focused around users. Um, and I wanna dive into that a little bit more, but as well as users, there's some other common principles. Uh, so one principle is that this is a continuous cycle of product development. So this never ends. You design, you have a strategy, you build something, you check in with the, your users to get feedback um, and your users and their problems are driving the product development. You maybe need to make some changes, you have a change management strategy, um, and then you go back to the drawing board and you design and you kind of start that process all over again. And as a core part of this, uh, not only is users and their problems being the driver for product development, um, but this why, this like value add that you're bringing is present from the beginning to the end at every stage of the cycle. And furthermore, the discovery and promotion and things like developer experience and marketing are really important, which unfortunately, if you have tried to build a healthcare API, you will know that this, <laughs> this is often not the case in healthcare. Um, so if we kind of think about that concept, like visually, you know, I think we can also say that there's something missing from the conversation in modern software about what APIs are. And what's missing is interoperability. It's the ability for APIs to actually connect with each other easily or with minimal integration effort. Um, it's kind of automated discoverability so that you can just you can point at an endpoint and get an understanding of that API's entire functionality and the things that are available to you as a consumer. And there's different efforts towards standards, et cetera, but we really haven't achieved interoperability um, across APIs or even within specific industries. Luckily, there are some tools for API interoperability um, that I wanna make sure we cover for those of you who are interested in maybe outside of healthcare or within healthcare too. Um, to start learning more about how we actually achieve an interoperable ecosystem. So things like schema.org, um, which is a open repository of open schemas that you can use to have schemas around data models that are shared across APIs. Uh, there's JSON schema.org, which is about validating JSON schemas. Um, JSON LD, which is a hypermedia format um, that is pretty commonly used actually. I think JSON LD is pretty baller. Um, so I'd recommend checking that out if you haven't already. Um, and there's more in-depth hypermedia formats that people use, such as JSON API, which has become pretty popular in some web development communities like Ember and Ruby on Rails. There's Collection JSON, HAL, um, and others. And these hypermedia formats are all about bridging that, or bridging that gap towards interoperability to say that it doesn't matter, you know, what industry your API is serving, if they can share a common structure and then you can begin to have some level of interoperability and you can have generic clients that can read a JSON API no matter who's providing it. Um, and then it, then you just have to kind of figure out that next level of semantics. Uh, there's also really cool stuff happening and have been happening for a long time in the semantic web community. Um, I think 
from my perspective, we don't see enough overlap between the API community and the semantic web community uh, because semantic web is really trying to achieve interoperability um, in a way that can be really academic and obscure to those of us just trying to build products. Uh, but I think they have a lot of really good ideas that I'd love to see us start using more. Um, and then likewise, there are also open API standards that are being developed like the open banking standard. Um, so check those out. So this is, this is APIs and interoperability from a modern kind of like overall industry agnostic perspective. But what about for healthcare? In healthcare, interoperability doesn't mean APIs. In fact, most of the time, not most of the time, sometimes um, when I talk to people in healthcare and we talk about APIs, what they're thinking of is for APIs is that APIs are just a transport layer. They think API means HTTP and they're not thinking about APIs as an architecture or you know, a set of different types of architectures that you can use. They're not really thinking of them as a product opportunity or about users and why a user might want an API. I think that this can be pretty problematic. Uh, and to go back to visuals, uh, this I think is really what we're doing when we talk about healthcare interoperability. We're just talking about the gears and we're completely ignoring the thing underneath the gears that make the gears turn. Um, and I think this leads to a lot of downstream problems. So if we look at healthcare's definition of interoperability, and this, this definition of four levels of healthcare interoperability is pulled from HIMSS, which is the Healthcare Information and Management System Society. They put on a big conference every year. Unfortunately, this year's was canceled, uh, but they drive a lot of the uh, community and conversation around healthcare and interoperability. Uh, they, they really think of healthcare interoperability in four steps. So there's foundational, which is basic requirements to securely communicate data between systems. The second level is structural. So the format, syntax, and organization of the data exchange. And then semantic, where we actually talk about what the data means and the underlying data models and the codification of the data uh, with shared definitions and meanings to the user. Um, and then finally, there's this fourth level organizational, which is actually a new level they've added recently to their definition, um, which is around governance and policy, social and legal considerations, et cetera. Excuse me. So what does this actually look like in practice? Um, so examples of the foundational level, we could be just talking about having a VPN connection and some web requests. We could be talking about SFTP or FTPS. Those two things are different. Um, from a structural perspective, we're talking about um, how are you structuring the data? Is this a JSON document? Is it an XML or an EDI document? Um, there's CSV is still a major common denominator across all systems. Um, and then there's also HL7, V2, and V3, uh, which I'm including, as you can see, in both the structural and the semantic side, uh, because HL7, which is a, a healthcare data exchange format from the 90s, um, it really started as it tried to solve both the structural and semantic issues. But what we see is that often in, in implementation, it tends to just be a structural concern. So um, you have the structure of an HL7 document, you have different fields that have been defined, but really people use those fields in all different sorts of ways and it's very implementation specific. So it can't really be called a standard from the semantic sense. Um, but there is progress being made on the semantic side um, so there's FIRE, Fast Healthcare Interoperable Resources. It's a more modern, REST-aspiring approach to interoperability um, and APIs with healthcare. And I think it's pretty exciting, and I'm really stoked about um, the increased FIRE adoption over the past few years. And then you also get examples like the United States Core Data for Interoperability, this US CDI. This was part of the Cures Act that came out recently um, that we'll talk about later. And this is about trying to define what are the data set, what are the data fields, what do those things mean, and what are the minimum requirement uh, required data fields to really consider an API interoperable. Um, and then organizationally, what we see is this is really tackled through uh, business associate agreements, memoranda of understanding, consent forms, policy compliance, etc. And it's not really tackled um, from a kind of an API or uh, systems perspective. Um, and I think what you'll notice if you take a look at all four of these is that to achieve all four levels of interoperability, you don't even need an API. You could have a CSV that's shared over SFTP. And as long as that CSV is standards-based and has all the 
right business associate agree- associate agreements in place, um, you have achieved um, HIMS perfect interoperability. Um, and I think that that's, um, you know, in some ways maybe solve some problems, but I think that we, there's still a lot of work to be done because while CSVs over SFTP are better than a stack of 2000 faxes in a small county health department, um, it's really not enough. Simply automating or digitizing manual processes and data exchange isn't enough. And this is the prevailing notion of healthcare interoperability, which is that we just need to make data exchange electronic. And that, that to me is not enough. So how do we get to interoperability? I am going to talk on two themes, uh, two big themes. We're gonna talk a little bit about the history and the kind of intersection or regulation and industry. And then we're gonna talk about users um, and kind of how this plays out in the industry today. So a uh, brief history, I'm not gonna go into all of this, uh, but essentially HL72 was started in 89. Um, we also have the creation, uh, 15 years later, we get the creation of the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. Um, this was an office that was created to basically promote better healthcare industry practices and healthcare um, interoperability. Uh, we get high tech and meaningful use in 2009, high tech proposed meaningful use of interoperable electronic health records. Um, it, this was a national, a critical national goal that um, every health record in the US had to be interoperable and electronic. Um, and then in 2011, we see that, oh, 2009 also establishes the funding for states to create their own health information exchanges. Um, so you can kind of think of these, health, if you're not familiar, health information exchanges are uh, both organizations and the systems underlying them, and they have to be nonprofit, um, that help the data flow between different health systems within a state or region. Um, they've had varying levels of success across the US. In 2011, um, we get Medicare, Medicaid, EHR incentive programs from CMS. Um, CMS, again, is Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. They're the biggest payer, or one of the biggest payers, biggest payer in the US, um, and they drive a lot of um, both policy and technology decisions in the healthcare industry in the United States. Um, and this became known as the Promoting Interoperability Programs because they had to get interoperability in there. Um, and then finally, also in 2011, you know, I guess folks realized the HL7 really wasn't working out. Interoperability was still very far away. So the initial draft of FIRE was published uh, by some folks who got together and tried to change this. We also saw in, um, a few years later Project Argonaut launching, which was really trying to bring multi -stake multiple stakeholders to the table to advance FIRE, to really drive industry adoption and get industry input into a standard um, that otherwise might just be academic or promoted in certain government spheres. Um, and then and then finally, uh, we get really cool innovation from CMS and from government in terms of both implementation and policy. So we get the CMS Blue Button 2.0 Fire API, um, one of the first live um, large scale Fire APIs in the US that grants um, beneficiaries access to their Medicare claims data from via an API and allows them to authorize using OAuth um, apps to have access to their claims data, which is super important um, because claims data is the most complete picture of somebody's health that you can get because you, especially in terms of Medicare, if you're on Medicare or Medicaid and this is your payer, then they are getting, um, you're getting payment, they're paying for all of your healthcare. So it doesn't matter which doctor you go to, which clinic, et cetera, when it was, um, we are getting all the data um, being sent to one place. And then you can actually get a full complete history uh, basically through your receipts, as opposed to having to go out to each different clinic and doctor, et cetera, to try to compile this picture of your healthcare. Um, and then this year, which is really exciting, uh, they just released the final patient access and interoperability rules from both ONC and CMS. Um, I'm grouping these together. They're technically separate rules, but they're basically the same thing. So that was the history. That's kind of how regulation has been driving interoperability in healthcare. It's been one of the primary drivers, but we did see there's a little bit of industry drivers with Project Argonaut and Fire, uh, which has been really powerful. Um, but I also want to make sure that we're talking about the users here, because I think from, from my perspective, 
um, in my experience in healthcare APIs and products, we often aren't thinking about the users um, because we're overwhelmed with the number of stakeholders and we're really just trying to move data around. Um, so really at the top, the top beneficiary of all of this, the top user and stakeholder is the patient ultimately. And all of us, each one of us is a patient. So this is really us. Um, there's also the patient's care team, providers, there's hospital administration staff, there's researchers, there's pharma, there's labs, there's manufacturers of medical devices, there's long-term care facilities and public health departments, there's social workers, like all of these are potential users in the healthcare ecosystem. And I think that this um, is one of the reasons why healthcare is so fragmented um, and because, because there's just so many people to be thinking about. And then we often lose sight of the patient um, amidst all of this and serving different users. But I wanna make sure that for the sake of this conversation and, and hopefully going forward as you're working on healthcare APIs that you are thinking about how is the patient ultimately impacted by this? Is this going to improve care? So um, visually interoperability, what this looks like um, from the 1990s and in many places today, we have a patient um, and we have uh, different organizations that are all connecting in different ways, fax, web portals, HL7v 2.3, um, CSVs, paper. And then, in, so you can see a lot of problems with this. I'm gonna, I realize I only have five minutes left, so I'm gonna try to speed up a little bit. Um, I already know I'm talking fast, sorry about that. Um, so there's some problems with this. There's all these one-off integrations. They're not real time. Patients can't access their own data in a machine readable or usable format. Uh, structure and semantics are not shared across systems. Um, and fundamentally, we're still talking about moving data between systems rather than making data usable, usable and actionable. Um, if you've ever seen EHRs or worked in EHR integrations, uh, EHR being the electronic health record, the system that often providers are using to keep track of patient charts, um, you'll just see when you do an integration, often what happens is you just tack on yet another screen that a doctor has to click through in order to see data because the focus is just on getting data into the system. It's not about creating usable products, user-centered products that drive patient outcomes. Um, since some of the regulation and since some of the fire advancements, we see a little bit of a different, um, different environment in some places. This is phase two. Uh, so from 2000s onwards to today, uh, we have health information exchanges and health information networks, which are helping to kind of bring together some level of interoperability um, and be that kind of data highway in a way or data warehouse even in many cases. We also have interface engines uh, that help drive connections and build better APIs and API experiences for providers and applications. Um, but we still have a pretty disparate system. Um, so it's better, it's better than the 90s, still not great. Um, because so, so some of the benefits to what's happening now is we get um, access to normalized or cleaned up data. New, the new players can more easily enter the market using middlemen or intermediaries. Um, and software developers and stakeholders can focus on adding value rather than just exchanging data. So we're definitely seeing more of that in a better industry and ecosystem. And hopefully all of this improves care. But really we still have a lot of the same problems. As I said, still have these one-off integrations, um, bad integrations that aren't real time. HIEs haven't been very successful in most places uh, because they don't really add a lot of value. It's just extra work. Um, and we're really still focusing on moving data between systems instead of making it usable and actionable and thinking about user experience and patient outcomes. So how do we go from all of that craziness um, where we've seen such slow progress over the past 30 years to truly interoperable APIs and how do we change our goal from this, which I think is often still the goal of many people and policymakers, to one like this, where we're talking about not only, you know, how the systems kind of interface with each other, but also how do they how do they work underneath? Um, and I'm I'm not saying that we have to be dictating how things work underneath. Um, of every system, but I do think that we have to make sure, we have to consider how things work underneath. We have to consider um, what's driving the APIs because that affects and adds constraints to how interoperable something can be if you're not taking into consideration real implementation concerns and limitations. Um, and if you're not helping to improve implementation, um, then we can't improve 
interoperability. And really the dream to where we wanna go is having truly interoperable APIs across the ecosystem and that are all being driven is with the user-focused mentality. So how do we get there um, in my last couple of minutes? <laughs> Uh, so first, I think we have to acknowledge that the 1990s aren't going anywhere anytime soon. Modernization takes time and investment. Uh, but while we modernize and while we improve systems, we have to not be moving from fax to CSV or CSV to HL7. I think we have to really start um, helping people invest in better infrastructure, taking bigger leaps. We have to invest in open and standards-based infrastructure like open source software and fire APIs. Um, and really start implementing FHIR. I think one of the great things about FHIR is FHIR is driven a lot by implementation and kind of working groups that are learning from implementation, but that needs to happen more. Um, a lot of the FHIR community is still pretty academic and um, you know they, they can learn a lot from people trying to build, build FHIR APIs, bringing their learnings back to the community and to the working groups and shaping the spec from implementation rather than the other way around. Um, we also need to refactor interoperability into an interoperable API strategy within organizations. So we have to adopt continuous API product development. We have to understand the why we're doing this from the beginning to the end. And we really have to make sure that users are part of the cycle and patients, even if they're not our direct user, are still top and center. Um, and we have to stop building silos. We have to invest in developer experience um, and getting our APIs out there. And then third, we need to design standards with users, um, users in this case being implementers. So FHIR, as I said, is being increasingly adopted. It's learning from adoption. We're getting these great multi-stakeholder groups and public-private partnerships that are pushing forward standards. Um, and we have really great examples coming from government because government has driven interoperability so far and now we're driving interoperability through implementation, which is one of the reasons I've been so excited to work at CMS for the past year. Um, CMS is at the forefront in implementing APIs that use FHIR, um, and we need to continue that implementation and that uh, work through increased collaboration with the FHIR community. And then finally, um, as I said, government drove interoperability so far. It is driving APIs. We have uh, these rules that came out that are mandating APIs, they're mandating interoperability and FHIR, um, and also learning through implementation. Um, CMS, one of the great things I've heard at CMS is that they don't want to mandate rules if they can't implement themselves. I think this is really fantastic. Um, we see great examples of API products coming from government, such as the Blue Button API, Data at the Point of Care, which is a really great API, putting claims data into the hands of providers. Same with Beneficiary Claims Data API. Um, and from the, uh, the VA, the Veterans Affairs Department, we also have the Lighthouse API, um, which came out relatively recently, I think in the past couple of years. So there's really great stuff happening in government, and I'm really excited to see government moving towards interoperable APIs. Um, we are on the journey to better health outcomes and value for patients. So let's reach our destination through user-focused, patient-centered, standards-based APIs that we can truly call interoperable. So thank you. Also, if you're interested in doing great interoperability work in government, please reach out to me or apply to USDS yes, because we are always hiring. So thanks. Hi, hi, Shelby. I think Kin may have uh, some connection issues, uh, so uh, so I'm joining. Thank you for uh, for this talk. So, uh, uh, what, one question though about the, uh, you know, like how was the the part of the uh, let's say the collaboration between the public sector and the private sector? Because in the U.S., some regulations are often led to the private sector directly to uh, to handle the. Uh, the interoperability at some point, and so they organize themselves. When in other areas of the world, it's more like directly government-driven. How was the, the the relationship, and let's say the arrangement of powers there? Um, in healthcare, the arrangement of powers between industry and government. Um, I mean, I think it's really interesting in healthcare. I think is probably the only example in the U.S. where government is really the driver of 
interoperability. And it's not just a driver through policy, which is really interesting. It's because CMS and the VA are the biggest industry players as well. So they are driving forward the industry through their own actions and implementation of APIs that are policy-based. Um, so if you want to integrate and get some of the most comprehensive data for the most beneficiaries, 60 million Americans and more, um, then you have to be able to integrate with CMS and VA and you have to be able to comply with them. So it's not just a matter of policy and regulation, but um, because these because government is actually an industry player too. Yeah, government, yeah, at, at least in healthcare, uh, uh, it is, uh, it, it is there. Uh, I'll just see if you, if you, if we see any more question from the audience there. Uh, yeah, I see, I see a question. Yeah, it's mostly, mostly about your presentation uh, there. So uh, yeah, there is a question. Does the CMS mandates the project model like DaVinci for uh, pharmacy benefit management and other model to be mandatory like blue button is mandatory? or just interoperability is fine? Um, so, I mean, so we are somewhat involved in the DaVinci project. Um, so the DaVinci project is really similar to Project Argonaut, but specifically for payers rather than providers. Um, so I don't think that we, so I think the role of CMS should be promoting interoperability policy, um, which they do, but also learning through and, and informing policy with implementation. And the blue button example, I think, is a really good example of what CMS should be doing, and there should be more of this, um, which is that CMS made this blue button API, it's Firebase, um, and then they mandated that it create a policy around um, making sure that other people can and should be building similar APIs, and they have to, other payers have to expose blue button-like APIs. Um, so what really this is, is Blue Button API. It's a functioning industry active product, um, but it's also an open source reference implementation for the industry to do the same thing. And I think CMS needs to be doing more of that. Um, we're doing that with data at the point of care, which is one of the first and beneficiary claims data API, the first ever um, implementations of the bulk fire spec. Um, so, so yes, I think CMS should be providing um, working, functioning, live, open source reference implementations that then industry can adopt and that inform policy. Yeah, thank you very much, Shelby. And now uh, after you, we'll have Nicholas Hatt who will actually explain uh, how the things are happening on the developer experience and how your the interoperability you're talking about can happen in real life. Uh, thank you very much, Shelby. I'll just go back with one question. Can you be fire-based on fire-based? No, that, that's an API joke, sorry for that. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And now we uh, we have Nicolas at stage. Thank you, Shelby. Yeah, thank you for being part of this community uh, for sure.